How is everybody doing today? So today we're going to talk about getting started with Windows PowerShell 3.0. And these are some of the things that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about using uh, Windows PowerShell 3 remoting uh, to manage remote machines. Um, we may talk a little bit about uh, troubleshooting desktops. Um, the, the thing that I really want you to take away from this is that using PowerShell um, is just as easy as uh, whether I'm using it local or whether I'm using it remote. And um, so with that, let's uh, kind of uh, go ahead and get started a bit. So let's show you another slide here. What is PowerShell? Now, one of the things that is a little confusing uh, for people who are just beginning to take a look at what is PowerShell is that there's actually, they think, well, there's two PowerShells. Uh, and they see some pictures of something that looks kind of like a blue DOS prompt. Uh, and they see something that you know, looks a lot more confusing and stuff. And the thing is that PowerShell is PowerShell. And whether I'm using PowerShell uh, to type commands in the PowerShell console or whether I'm actually writing a script, the, the language, the syntax, is the same. And so when I used to teach my PowerShell workshops, I, I would spend two days uh, out of a week, and we were in the PowerShell console. And we were typing commands and working with commands and doing all of that. And it wouldn't be until like Wednesday morning that we would actually start talking about scripting. Now, every once in a while, you know, not always, but every once in a while, somebody would ask a question and they'd say, hey, you know, we need to be looking at scripting. And, and I'd show them, you know, that, yeah, everything that we're doing you know, in the console is actually what you might very well put into a PowerShell script. And um, so, so keep that in mind. PowerShell is PowerShell is PowerShell. And in its most basic form, a uh, PowerShell script is simply a collection of PowerShell commands, if you will. Now, most of us know, um, or a lot of people know, that um, PowerShell has what we call commandlets. And that's actually spelled C-M-D-L-E-T, commandlet, if you will. Um, back in the early beta, um, uh, probably even before we made it public, it was actually spelled command, let, C-O-M-M-A-N-D-L-E-T. Uh, but uh, then we shortened it because, I mean, that was too much typing. <laughs> so, um, now, commandlets uh, can be written. You, know, you could write them yourself in um, C Sharp or VB.net if you wanted to. Uh, but most of the time, most normal uh, IT pros are not writing commandlets. In PowerShell 2, and it continues in PowerShell 3, we introduce what are called advanced functions. And this actually allows me to essentially write a commandlet in PowerShell code. And that opens up a whole lot of possibilities. And, and we're not going to talk about that today at all. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go in just a little bit. And um, one of the things to keep in mind you know, when working you know, with uh, Windows PowerShell you know, is that you know, IT pros need to work with lots of different computers. You know, they don't just work with um, – you know, they don't just work with, um, like, computers on their local machine. You know, they work with different computers. They need to, uh, to remote out and touch some stuff. And so that's why I'm going to kind of be hitting remoting here. Uh, now, in PowerShell 3, you know, especially on Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012, you know, remoting is, is really easy. But even using PowerShell 2 and Windows Server 2000 and AR2, you know, PowerShell remoting – you know, works really well, particularly, you know, in um, you know, a domain, you know, model, you know, where, where you can, you know, use your credentials and stuff, you know, between different machines and stuff. Uh, if you need to start working with machines that are outside the domain, you know, that are maybe in a work group or something, that it gets a little bit more complicated to set up. But once it's set up, it just simply works. So uh, what I'm going to do um, 
is I'm going to show you the different ways that we can do some remoting. And I'm going to show you working local and working remotely. And um, so with that, then I'm going to switch to my um, desktop here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, c uh, connect to a workstation. Now, I've actually got uh, three computers that are running you know, in Hyper-V here on my um, Windows 8 laptop. And uh, one is a domain controller, and two of them are client workstations. Now, those client workstations are named C1 and C2 because it simplifies typing. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share. Okay, so this is my domain controller, DC1, and I've got my PowerShell console opened up. Now, I can uh, type in um, get process. Come on. And press enter, and I get a listing of process information on my local computer. Now, with PowerShell, our commandlets have two part names. Uh, the first part is a verb, like get, and the second part is, um, uh, is, a, um, uh, is a noun, you know, like service, for instance. And I can press enter, and I get information about the service. Um, so where I could say get event log. Spelling counts, and that gets all the all the entries from my event log. So all of these are running local against my local computer. Now, as I said, I'm on a domain controller. Now, if I try to run uh, these commands against a remote computer, such as C1, uh, which is a workstation, this command will fail. And the reason that it will fail um, is because of the firewall uh, that is on my uh, client machine. So by default, the firewall does not permit me to run uh, these, type of, uh, these type of commands. So if I say like get WMI object, for instance, which was the only command um, that I could remote in PowerShell 1 and specify the um, – and uh, specify the computer name, this will fail as well uh, because it does not allow, uh, we haven't poked that hole. So in PowerShell 1, if I wanted to use WMI to uh, get information from a remote computer like a workstation uh, with the Windows firewall running, I had to open up the management exception. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if I wanted to use get process or get event log or get service or some of those commandlets from PowerShell 2, um, then I had to open up additional holes in the firewall. So at the end of the day, your firewall kind of looks like Swiss cheese. Now, I like Swiss cheese on crackers or something, but I don't particularly like it for my firewall. So now I have, uh, I'm on C1, which is the, um, the client machine, one of the client machines, and I'm gonna say get process. And we can see, yeah, it works here on my local computer. And now I'm going to specify that I want to do this from DC1. Now, because uh, domain, uh, and my domain controller uh, is running the Windows firewall, but we open up management holes on that server firewall because we realize that servers need uh, the ability for more people to be able to connect and do stuff than a client workstation might. If I was to, uh, to try to connect to C2 from here, then this will fail as well. And the reason is because I haven't opened the hole in the Windows firewall. Okay? Um, now, one of the things that's really cool uh, uh, about this, and uh, we'll just stay here with, the, uh, with our client, uh, client 2 machine. Now, I can take these commands, and I can uh, send them across what's called the pipeline. Now, this little bar right there, and on my keyboard, uh, it's just above the enter, so uh, the, uh, just above the enter key. That is the pipeline character. So this says take all of the information from get process. We're going to send it across the pipeline, and then I'm going to do something on the other side. 
And that's something I'm going to do on the other side here is I'm just going to select uh, name and ID. <coughs> and you can see that there's the name of all my processes and the process IDs. Okay? So uh, this, this brings the information from one side. We send it across a pipe, and then I can choose only the information that I want. Uh, if I don't, then, yeah, I wind up with a lot more information that perhaps I'm just not interested in. Now, one of the things I look at uh, when I'm actually looking at processes on a, um, uh, on a computer, on a workstation, or on a server, I look at things like virtual memory. Um, I look at things like the amount of CPU time. Uh, I look at uh, stuff like um, the working set uh, that's, that's committed or the amount of paged memory uh, or the number of ha uh, handles or something like this. There's a number of things that I have a tendency to look at. So one of the things I can do then is I can say select uh, the name of the process. And this time, um, but before we do that, let's sort. Uh, so I'm going to sort all of these processes by CPU time. And we can see that we started at zero, which is the idle process, all the way down to this uh, MSMP engine. Now, the problem is I'm not interested in who's using the least amount of CPU time. You know, I'm interested in who's using the most. So let's change our sort order to descending. And I press Enter, and it says Groovy. Now, at this point, we can see who's using the most uh, CPU time. But, you know, I'm interested in really select the name and the CPU time, and I'm only interested in the um, – in the first five. Okay, so now I found the people, or the processes rather, that are using the most CPU time. Now, I can do this against a remote server. So I'm going to say CN DC1. And um, so now we come over here. Now, we didn't get the CPU information coming back from there, but we did get our, um, our process information from DC1. So there is a number of steps that we can do when we're working with this. Now, if I go back to my um, other server, though, suppose I want to do this on a uh, – actually, I'll stay here. And I want to do this against a, um, another workstation. Well, if I was going to do this on the other workstation, then I'm going to have to open up holes in the firewall that would permit uh, this command to be able to execute against that other machine. So I'm going to uh, stop this, and uh, we're going to go back to our, um, to our slide as soon as the uh, control uh, relinquishes. Okay, so now we go back to our slides. So um, when I'm working with services, then um, I can use the get service commandlet, and I can change things about those by using the set service commandlet. Now, there's not a computer name parameter, but that really isn't going to be all that big of a deal anyway. And the reason it's not that big of a deal is because um, – yeah, I'd have to open holes in the firewall for it to work anyway. So what we're going to do then is we're going to use invoke command. Now, invoke command was first introduced in PowerShell 2, and it continues in PowerShell 3. Now, what pow uh, invoke command does is uh, it um, allows me to run commands against a remote computer. Now, this uses the WinRM protocol, which uh, is part of the PowerShell 2.0 management package, and um, it's also in PowerShell 3, of course. And so it's not turned on by default in PowerShell 2. In PowerShell 3, it is turned on by default on the server. So I can manage my servers, my Windows Server 2012 servers. I can manage them automatically. I don't have to do any configuration. 
if I want to enable um, WinRM to manage workstations, then I can use group policy uh, to, uh, to configure that. So I could say allow the WinRM protocol to um, go through the firewall. Or I can even use like a startup script or something and run the enable PS remoting um, commandlet. And um, so once that's done, uh, then I can now use PowerShell remoting. And this allows me to use a number of commandlets. And uh, so in order to, uh, to use invoke command, then we have to first enable PowerShell remoting on everything except Windows Server 2012. Uh, to enable PowerShell remoting, we simply can use the enable PS remoting commandlet, or we can use group policy. Let's take a look at a, a demo. And uh, so I'm going to pop back over and uh, share my screen. Okay, so we were talking about remoting. So there is uh, a command, enable PS remoting. And uh, I've already got remoting turned on on this computer. Uh, so I'm going to use a switch. No, nah, I'm not. Uh, we'll just do it this way. And the nice thing about this, and, and I am so proud of the PowerShell team for doing this, uh, because I want you to see right here where I've got my little mousey. Uh, it says this is going to do four things. Okay? Uh, and the reason I am so proud of the PowerShell team for doing this is this is what you call a full disclosure. How many times have you ever read something where it says you have to run this command and you have absolutely no idea what changes those, that command is going to do to your system? So we tell you exactly what this is going to do. And not only that, but you can say, yeah, I want to do this. Yeah, I want to do this. No, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I want to do that. Okay? So you can step through this command by default. So it's going to start or restart WinRM service. It's going to change WinRM to automatic. Now, if you're going to do remoting, you have to do that, right? It's going to create a listener that will accept requests from any IP address. Now, in an extremely high security environment, you may not want to do that. Um, and so, therefore, you may want to use group policy or, a, or another tool to configure uh, PowerShell remoting manually. It's going to open up a firewall inbound rule for WizMan inbound only HTTP. And again, if you're going to be using uh, WinRM, you'd probably want to do that anyway. So for most situations, you're going to be absolutely fine doing this. Uh, in, a more high, in a high security environment, you may want to configure your own listener um, and, um, and do this, this thing manually. So I could just say um, yes. And then it says, yeah, 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 yeah. And it goes through there, yeah, 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 yeah. And then everything's groovy. Um, and uh, the other thing that's really nice is that, look, it even lets you know uh, what the security, the SDDL, uh, that it's performing on these as it's creating your listeners and all of that. So that's the enable uh, PowerShell remoting. Now, I did this on a Windows Server 2012. I don't have to do this on Windows Server 2012 because PowerShell remoting, WinRM, is already set up. Now, at this point, I'm going to say invoke command. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to up arrow and go back to this command that failed. Okay? So remember this, this command failed. Bummer. Okay. Now, all I need to do is put this in what's called a script block. So um, a script block is curly brackets. Okay, see the curly brackets. That curly bracket on my uh, computer is right above the square bracket on the keyboard. So I create my script block, and I say invoke command. And then I specify the computer name, C1. Um, and then I can specify the script block, and this is the script block. Now we're going to come over here. Obviously, I don't need this part. And I press enter, and Groovy, it works. Now, I can also, and before it didn't, I can also put an array here, and Groovy, that works. The nice thing is that when I use invoke command here, it automatically adds a parameter that is called PS computer name. So uh, when I run this, I get PS computer name C1 and C2. 
Now, let's suppose that I need uh, alternate credentials. And I'm going to say that if you're an admin, you should need alternate credentials because you should not be running your computer, your laptop, uh, your desktop. You should not be running that with admin rights. And therefore, you should have to specify alternate credentials if you're going to do some remote management. Now, this is actually extremely easy to do. So I'm going to create a variable. So um, this, uh, in, in PowerShell, all of our variables begin with a dollar sign. So you see the dollar sign there. That means that in Europe and other places, variables are extremely cheap nowadays. So uh, dollar cred, which is short for credential, but it's a whole lot less typing. So dollar cred is equal to get credential. And now I'm going to specify that I want my credential object to be NW Traders uh, Administrator. And I press Enter. And when I do, this little dialog box pops up. Uh, Windows PowerShell credential, blah, blah, blah. So type in my password. Now I'm going to stop talking so I make sure I type this password correctly. Okay, now I'll say okie dokie and voila. So I could specify, uh, look at dollar cred and we can see that yes, it's NW Trader Administrator and my password is a secure string. Well, how do I use this turkey? Well, I'm going to use up arrow, back to invoke command. C1, C2, script block, blah, 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 dash credentials, and dollar cred. And now I press enter, and I'm now running this against these remote machines in the context of NW Traders Administrator. Okay, now what I want to show you now is like so, so cool. Okay, first of all, let me describe the problem to you. Uh, get W my object. Uh, anybody uh, that has used um, WMI for very long has run into this problem. Uh, computer name, DC1. Now remember, I'm on DC1. And I shouldn't be logged on with admin rights. I should be logged on as a plain old user. And so except this is a domain controller, which blah, blah, blah. So remember, this is a simulation, okay? Now, so what I oftentimes need to do is to specify alternate credentials for a local connection, okay? So this is get WMI object. You know, I'm wanting to query my local machine. I'm wanting to specify alternate credentials, and I press Enter, and it's going to come back and say, no way, Jose, because user credentials – cannot be used for local connection. Bummer. Major bummer. Colonel bummer, if it even gets promoted. So what can we do then? Well, look, I can go right back here. I can use invoke command, C1, C2, comma, DC1, and I press enter, and groovy. There we go. There's C1, C2, and C3. So this is a nice way to get around this extremely cumbersome problem of alternate credentials with WMI for a local connection. Okay, so let's uh, pop back to my slide deck. For, oh, we were going to talk about services, sorry. So I'm going to clear my screen, and I'm going to say get service. Now, one of the things, I don't have to type all of these commands out. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm typing S-E-R-V, uh, then I press tab, um, and it brings up the, uh, the commandlet name. So that's called tab expansion. Now, in PowerShell 1, tab expansion was extremely efficient because we only had 129 commandlets. In PowerShell 3 on Windows Server 2012, uh, there are more than 2,000 commands. So that's why when I start you know, hitting tab, you can see it kind of goes along for a while. So if I'm working locally, I may very well use GSV, which is a um, alias for Git service. You can see it works, but yeah, you know, that's that's too hard um, uh, for people um, you know, to, who are just becoming uh, familiar with PowerShell. 
So uh, you'll learn the aliases as you go along, um, and it's perfectly acceptable. I use them all the time uh, when I'm working inside this PowerShell console. So um, there's my services. Now, if I want to look at all of the information that's associated with a service, then I could do a couple of things. And what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to look for a service with the name of uh, BITS, okay, B-I-T-S. So I'm going to say where name uh, is equal to BITS, and I press Enter, and it comes back. Now, look at this right here. Notice that I did not have to put quotation marks around the word bits. Okay? So that's actually pretty cool. So now what I want to do, now I can rewrite this and get rid of that where clause and do it that way. Um, but I wanted to show you taking this, sending it across the pipe, and filtering this out by using the where object commandlet. So this is my where clause right here, where the name is equal to bits. That works. This works. You know, however is easy for you to get the information. So I want to get this information on all of my other computers. Now, I'm getting tired of always typing the names of these computers. So, I mean, suppose I've got like 10,000 workstations. So what I can do is this. I could say get AD computer, specify a filter with a star. Now, when I do this, this is going to return every computer that is on the network. Okay? Now, I want to also get the operating system. So properties, uh, operating system. So now I've got the operating system as well. So I'm going to now store this in a variable, and I'm going to say $CN uh, is equal to this. Now in PowerShell 3, I can now get the names of my computers. So I say cn.name, blah, 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 blah. Now what I want to do is I am going to create a remote session to all of these computers, and I'm going to store this in a variable. I'll just call this dollar $Session uh, is equal to um, new PS Session. Uh, computer name is $CN.name. The credentials are in my variable that we created earlier. So I'm going to run this. Now, some of these computers are not turned on. So remember I told you that I only have my two C1 and C2 computers um, and my domain controller. So I'm only running three computers. These two computers, C7 and SQL1, are not accessible. So I am expecting to get an error. I know I'm going to get an error. Um, but hey, you know, I'm just like kind of being cheap here. And uh, so SQL1, C7, they're not available. That's fine. What do I actually have in my session? I have an open session to C1, C2, and DC1. So now I can run anything, invoke command uh, to the session, and my script block, uh, which was get service, bits because I'm interested in the status of the BITS service. And we can see that it is stopped on C1, it is stopped on DC1, and it is running on C2. Hmm. Okay. So this tells me then that I can now come back and I need to stop uh, the BITS service on, um, on C2. Now, there's several ways I could do this. Um, I can use invoke command uh, to C2 and say stop service. Uh, or, you know, I could just do it this way. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of cheat here. I'd say groovy. And uh, so now I run my command, and it stopped on all of them. 
So uh, that was the cheap way. You know, I just up arrow, you know, added this little command to the end of it, and I stopped my service so that everything is now the same on these machines. Okay, I'm going to exit out of this. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. We've got several questions, as a matter of fact. All righty, we have a question from Earl who would like to know, um, is PowerShell Microsoft's equivalent to Linux's Bash shell? Oh, um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. The, uh, the, uh, it, it, sort of. Um, it, but it is much, much more. And um, the reason it's much, much more um, is uh, because uh, PowerShell passes objects. And so everything that we do in PowerShell is an object. Um, and um, the, the Bash shell or the Corn shell, those, those types of things, uh, those pass strings. Uh, and so what happens then is when you're working in those environments, you have to be very, very good at, um, um, at um, using like regular expressions to parse text and everything. Because you know, you run a command, you'll get back information that's text, and then you have to parse it. So for instance, when I got my list of computer names, then that returned back a lot of information. Those were objects, and so I was able to say, you know, cn dot name and get the value of the name property. If I was using, um, you know, a different type of shell environment at that point, I would have to do a regular expression that would pick up the, pro uh, the value of the name properties. Okay, so um, I will say this, uh, that all of my, uh, my Linux buddies, um, when they come to PowerShell, they immediately get it. Um, and they say, wow, this is really, really cool. It's extremely powerful. Um, a lot of my Windows buddies, when they come to PowerShell, they're a bit confused because <laughs> they hadn't seen anything like this before. <laughs> Uh, so, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think yeah, I do know lots and lots and lots of Linux people that uh, are immediately productive with PowerShell. Um, the thing is that they just have to um, get this idea about working with objects, you know, and realize that they don't have to write as many regular expressions as they used to. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about hot fixes and. Um, so we're going to talk about hot fixes, and then we're going to talk about event logs, and that's going to be it for today. So working with hot fixes, um, we have a command line. It's called get hot fix, and um, so we can use this by saying get hot fix and specify computer name, and get back to hot fixes. We can search by uh, a specific ID, we can search by a description, or something like that. But remember, as I mentioned before, them that the firewall is going to be the issue. And so with this, you know, if, you, if you're not running the Windows firewall, which I recommend that you do, but if you're not, then these things just work straight up. But um, if you are using the, uh, the Windows firewall, then what you're going to need to do is to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that you just use invoke command. And uh, we can run this, and we can get this information back, um, and it will, um, you know, and it'll just um, kind of like pop up there, and uh, you'll be able to uh, get that information. <laughs> uh, so I've got get hotfix, and this gives me a listing of the hotfixes that are on these um, these virtual machines. Uh, so this is DC1. Now there is a computer name parameter, um, and I can try to run it against my remote computer, but because that firewall is there, it's not going to happen. But now this is really easy, though, because all I need to do is say invoke command. And remember, I already created my remote session, so I'm just going to use that same session that I stored. I've already got my credentials. And uh, so um, and those are in a variable. Come on. Sometimes you have to do more typing than you think of. <laughs> um, now, actually, look at this command right here. This is actually the way that I generally work uh, with PowerShell. 
this part of this command will never change because I've got my sessions in this variable, I've got my credentials in this variable, so the only thing that's going to change then is my actual script block itself. So I can say script block, and then there's my script block. So what I'm going to do here is use get hotfix. Oh, you whiner. What do you mean? Oh, I know what I mean. Uh, sorry about that. I already included credentials when I did the session. So, Okay, so this says that the parameter set can't be resolved, and this is because session already had credentials, and I was trying to add additional credentials. So credential works with the CN parameter, the computer name parameter, but not with right here like that. So that's what that error was. Uh, one of the nice things about PowerShell, read the error messages. Um, in other scripting languages like VBScript, the error messages were often convoluted and sometimes even misleading. In Windows PowerShell, our error messages tell you what the problem is. So make sure that you read these. So the RPC server is unavailable. That lets me know absolutely that I'm not getting through to that computer can't resolve the parameter set. That lets me know that I messed up my command, okay? So this right here, then invoke command. I get my hot fixes back from all the computers, local and remote. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, I need to parse this information. So I don't want to run this command over and over and over and over again because that would generate a lot of extra network traffic, particularly if I'm doing this against 10,000 computers. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to store these results in a variable. So I'm just going to call this HF for hot fix and say Groovy. So now I just say $HF, and you can see it's exactly the same information that we had up here. And so now I'm going to group this. Uh, I want to group it, first of all, by hotfix ID. And we can see that three computers have this hotfix and two computers have that hotfix. Okay. So uh, let's do this then. Let's, go, uh, let's turn around and group by description. And we can see that we got three updates and two security updates. Hmm, okie dokie. So uh, what we could do then is, um, since we have this information, then uh, let's, let's sort this by hotfix ID. And now we can look through here and we can easily see that this hotfix ID ending with 352, has been installed on all three of these computers. But this security update, ending in 399, was only installed on these two computers. So the question that we have to ask ourselves then is, is this security update required on a Windows Server 2012 machine? Yeah, if that's needed on my domain controller, then this is letting me know that my domain controller is missing an update. Okay, so this gives me exactly the information that I need in order to be able to parse this stuff and to try to be able to find the information that I want. Now let me go back over here uh, to this command, and this time I'm going to take a look at my event log. The log name is application, uh, and I only want the newest um, entry. And so I run this, and I come back, and we can see that, um, so, okay, so looking at this, uh, at uh, this time, we can see that there was a software protection thing on C2, um, ESENT on C1 from MSI Exec, and the desktop window manager um, has an entry on DC1. So I don't see any specific problems there uh, that are, like, bugging me. So I'm going to come back now, and I'm going to say, show me the um, errors. And I want to see the newest um, two entries. 
And so we can see here that we have errors from software protection on, um, on my C1 and C2 machines. So something about the license. Maybe I need to take a look at that. <laughs> um, and then uh, on DC1, uh, something about a performance library and when log on. So I may need to investigate those as well. But um, so that's it. We thank you, Ed. We thank everyone for attending. This will conclude our webcast today. Goodbye, everyone.